In previous video tutorials, we've seen how we can determine reaction forces and maximum bending moment values for both cantilever and built-in beams. In this video tutorial, we're going to revisit some of that information specifically for cantilever beams, but we're also going to look at how we can then determine the stress acting on the cantilever beam. And in particular, we're going to see how we can determine the stress acting on a cantilever beam when the beam itself is an I section beam. So rather than using a square section or hollow section, this time we're using an I section beam. So we have a diagram on the screen here. And in the diagram, we see that we have a cantilever beam of length 12 meters. We know that this is a cantilever beam because it's only supported on the left hand side. We also have a load being applied of 24.5 kilonewtons. And that load is being applied four meters from the support. We're going to use similar conditions in the next video when we look at a built in beam. But in this particular scenario, we have a cantilever beam with the load applied four meters from the support. Now I've already done some quick calculations for this. We know that if the only force being applied is a point load of 24.5 kilonewtons, then the reaction at the support must be equal to the load being applied. So in the top left hand corner, we have 24,500 newtons for the reaction force. We can also do a quick calculation to determine the maximum bending moment. The maximum bending moment, which occurs at the support, is the magnitude of the applied force times the distance from the support. So once again, we have 24,500 times four for the distance, giving us a maximum bending moment of 98,000 newton meters. So we know the support reaction and we know the maximum bending moment. Now we want to determine the stress acting on the beam. Now we're going to approach this slightly differently and we're going to determine the maximum stress acting on a specific I section beam. Now I've provided the beam designation there, 356 by 127 by 39. And at the bottom of the screen, we have some specific data relating to universal I section beams. And you have this data from an earlier lesson. Now, if we refer to the table, we're looking for information relating to 356 by 127 by 39. And in order to determine the stress, the value that we're looking for is the maximum Z value or the maximum elastic section modulus when our beam is orientated on the XX axis. This is where the beam is strongest and most resistant to bending. So we see that our elastic section modulus this time is 576. So we have some information for our chosen beam. We know that the Z value or the elastic section modulus is 576 centimeters cubed. And hopefully you recall from earlier videos that if we wanted that in meters cubed rather than centimeters cubed, we would need to do a conversion where we divide by 100 cubed. Well, 576 divided by 100 cubed equals 5.76 times 10 to the minus 4, or expressed as a decimal, we have 0 0.000576 meters cubed. Now, we also learned in an earlier tutorial that Z equals M over sigma. So rearranging that for the stress sigma, we know that the stress is just M over Z. Well, we have our maximum bending moment value of 98,000. We have our Z value of 0 0.000576, meaning that the maximum stress acting on this beam equals 170.14 megapascals. I've also done the conversion there to get from pascals to megapascals. So we have a cantilever beam with 24,500 newtons being applied at four meters. The total length is 12 meters, which is somewhat irrelevant in this particular calculation. We've been given a beam designation. And from that beam designation, we've been able to determine the elastic section modulus 
and hence the maximum stress acting on that beam. Whilst we have this information in front of us for our chosen beam, we're actually going to gather some additional information from the universal eye section beam tables. Now, the reason why we're going to do this is because we're going to aim to validate our results using numeric simulations. We're going to use a software package called Fusion 360, and we're going to construct our eye section beam as a 3D CAD model. And then we're going to use something called finite element analysis in order to determine the principal stresses acting on that beam. Now, all of this will be explained as we go through the video, but the information that we need to obtain here relates to the dimensions of the beam. Now, we have a small diagram in the top right-hand corner, which is also included on the eye section beam tables. And this shows the cross-section of our eye section beam. We're going to extract four key pieces of information. We're going to determine the overall width of our section, B. We're going to determine the overall height, H. We're going to determine the flange thickness, T. Note that the top and bottom flange have the same thickness. And we're also going to determine the thickness of the webbing, S. When it comes to constructing this infusion, we're going to simplify the model slightly, so we're not going to include our fillet radius, R. We're just going to have a standard I section without the fillet radiuses. So we need B for our beam designation 356 by 127 by 39. So we see here B is the width of the section and B is 126 millimeters. We need the height H and the height is 353.4 millimeters. We need the thickness of the webbing S which is 6.6 millimetres, and we need the thickness of the flange T, which is 10.7 millimetres. Now, before we go too much further, we're going to collate all of the key information from this slide, and then we'll discuss in a little bit more detail how we're going to validate these results using Fusion. So we're going to transfer our values of the height, width, web thickness, and flange thickness for our chosen beam, and we're also going to take our reaction force, maximum bending moment, and maximum bending stress values. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we see the values mentioned previously for our beam designation 356 by 127 by 39. Now we're going to use these values of B, H, T, and S to construct a 3D CAD model of our beam in Fusion 360. Once we've done that, we're going to aim to validate through numeric simulations our values for the maximum reaction force, the maximum bending moment, and the maximum bending stress as determined from our hand calculations. So we're going to go over to Fusion 360 now, and I'm going to provide a step-by-step -step explanation on how we can construct our model and use finite element analysis, or FEA, in order to determine each of these values. Okay, so I'm going to describe the process of creating a 3D model of our eye section beam, and I'm going to do this in as much detail as possible for those of you who haven't used this software before. The first thing that we need to do is produce a sketch of the cross section of our eye section beam, and we then need to extrude it through the length of our beam, which was 12 meters. Now our sketching tool is up in the top left hand corner here, and our extrusion tool is next to it. So the two tools that we're going to be using, first of all, are Sketch and Extrude. These are both part of the Create menu here. So we're going to left click on Create Sketch. We then need to select which face on this cube we're going to sketch on. And I'm going to sketch on the front plane here. Remember here, we're creating a scale drawing of the cross section of our beam. The tool that we're going to use up here is the line tool. Now our first dimension is going to go from our origin and it's going to be going right here. Notice that it already snaps to zero degrees. So we know that we're heading in the right direction. And without left clicking, I'm going to type the length that I want that line to be. Now recall that the value of B was 126. Our dimensions are already in millimeters. So I'm going to type 126 and then hit enter. And now my first line is in position. 
we have various pan and orbit tools down at the bottom here. So I'm going to select pan, and by holding the left mouse button, I can move that line around the workspace. So I'm going to move it nearer the bottom. I'm going to hit escape to come out of that tool, and I'm going to select the line tool again. This time, I'm starting from the end of my previous line. Once again, I'm snapping, this time to 90 degrees, so that my line is vertical. And this time, I'm going to go the full height of the beam, H, 353.4 millimeters. I type in my value and hit enter. And I know that the line that's been constructed is now at the correct length. Also in my tools at the bottom here, I've got one here, which is fit to screen. So left clicking, pulls my model into the screen there. Now there's numerous different ways that you can create this 2D sketch. I'm going to aim to keep things as simple as possible so that you can follow through step by step. So I'm going to take another line. I'm going to start from my original origin point. I'm going to go upwards 90 degrees. And this is our flange thickness of 10.7 millimeters. Now this time we have a number of different options. I'm going to draw the horizontal line that heads this way but I only want to draw it the distance up to the webbing. Now, once again, there's lots of different ways we can do this, but I'm actually going to use a formula. And in that formula, I'm going to specify that this distance is the full width B, which was 126 millimeters, minus my webbing thickness. Now the webbing thickness S was 6.6 .6 millimeters. I'm going to put brackets around those two values and then I'm going to divide by two. Now, alternatively, you could determine this distance beforehand, or you could even extract this distance from the I section beam tables. But I'm going to use a formula, then at the end I can do a final check that my dimensions are correct, because I can measure the webbing thickness. Okay, I'm going to use a similar approach for my line going upwards. Now, I know that my line going upwards is the total height, which was 353.4. But this time I need to minus two times my flange thickness. So two times, and we use star for times in the same way that we do in Excel. And my flange thickness was 10.7 millimeters. And hit enter. Okay. Now things become a little bit more straightforward because I'm going to draw a line from the end of the previous line and I could use the same formula as I did at the bottom. But what Fusion also does is if I hover over this corner end point here, then you notice that Fusion is now snapping to that line. So I need a horizontal line, but I need to snap to the original starting point or essentially snap to horizontal of the origin and then I can place that point. Now, once again, there's lots of different ways of doing that. Okay, next we need a line upwards. I'm going to pan my model. Whenever we pan, we need to remember to escape to come out of that tool. I'm going to create a line upwards again. This time, the line upwards is the flange thickness of 10.7. The final line on this side of my model is going to connect the end of that line to the end of my original vertical line. Now this serves as a good first check because we can see that the line I've just drawn is horizontal, meaning that we know our final point here was in the correct position. Now next, what I'm actually going to do is left click on that original vertical line and delete it. All I did there was hit delete on my keyboard. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because that isn't technically part of our cross section. I just used it as a construction line. So I'm going to continue in the same way. I need to come down 10.7, type 10.7, hit enter. I need to come across. I'm going to use the formula again, just as a reminder how to do this. So open brackets, 126 was the overall width. The webbing was 6.6, .6. close brackets, dividing by two, and hit enter. 
just pan the model again. Now I'm going to use the same indexing method that I used previously. So I click on my start point. I want it to index to this point here, but I also want it to be vertical, like so. Start a new line. I want it to index to my end point here, but I want it to be horizontal. We could see that that line's 59.7 millimeters. Left click. And then my final line is going to join my starting point here to my finish point on the previous line, which is going to complete the outline of my sketch. I'm just going to do one check, as I mentioned. I want to make sure my webbing thickness is 6.6 .6 mil. So under the Create menu, we have a sketch dimension. I click the left-hand line of the webbing. I click the right-hand line of the webbing and I drag to the right, and I can see that that webbing thickness is 6.6 .6 millimeters. Now I could place that dimension, and Fusion's probably going to tell me that the model's over constrained, because I've already fully dimensioned and constrained all of those lines. I just wanted to check that thickness, so rather than place the dimension, I'm going to hit Escape. And over here on the right hand side, I'm going to click Finish Sketch. So you'll see that my sketch is now fully constrained, and ready to be extruded. OK. Over here in the top right hand corner, we can orientate our model in space. At the moment, we're just viewing the front face. But instead, I'm going to hit the home icon. And we'll see now that we can see that as a 2D sketch in 3D space. I'm going to extrude my model. I'm going to select the sketch that I've just produced. And I'm going to extrude this back into the page. You'll notice that the arrow is pointing back into the page. The distance that I want to extrude is the length of my beam, 12 meters. But note that our model dimensions here are millimeters, so I need 12,000. Once I've typed my measurement, I can click OK. And I'm going to click the home icon in the top right hand corner again, so that I can check my beam. OK, this is a good time to save our model, because this particular model we're going to use for our cantilever simulations, and then we're going to use the same beam model for some encastre beam simulations in the next tutorial. So let's save. Now you can call this what you like. I'm going to use the beam designation 356 by 127 by 39. I'll call this V2. So we have our model fully dimensioned. The only simplification we've made is we haven't put the fillet radiuses on our eye section beam, but that's gonna make little impact to our simulations. Let's switch from the design workspace in the top left hand corner. And instead, we're going to select the simulation workspace. Now the type of study we're going to select is a static stress study, top left hand corner and create study. Now there's a few things that we need to do in order to prepare this model for simulations and we're going to follow through the icons at the top here. We have one option which is to simplify the model. We're going to ignore that because we've already made simplifications to the model. The next one is materials. Now by default the study material here is going to be steel. And if we were interested in the material, we could change that. But in actual fact, irrespective of the material, the maximum stress that we're interested in won't actually be affected by the selection of that material. What would be affected is whether the material would fail or the factor of safety on that material. But given that the model material is already steel, which is a sensible material for an I-section beam, we're going to cancel that menu and leave the beam as steel. The next thing we're going to do then is look at our structural constraints. Now we're only going to apply one constraint to this model and we're going to apply a fixed constraint to the supported end of our cantilever beam down here in the bottom left hand corner. Now to make sure we select the right face, we need to pan that end of the beam into the center of the page. We need to zoom in using the next option to the right of our pan function. And you may need to do this a few times. Zoom, 
pan, zoom, pan, hit escape, and we need to pick the end face of our eye section beam here. Now to apply that fixed constraint, note that it's fixed in the x, y, and z directions, we need to hit OK. And then I'm going to return to the home view of our 3D model. The end of our beam is constrained. So next then, we need to apply our load. Now we want a point load at four meters of 24,500 newtons. Now the simplest way for us to apply this load is using something called a remote force. Now when we select remote force, it's going to ask for a target face. And when we select the top face, you'll notice that the remote force is already being applied at the very center of that face. Let's go over to our menu on the right hand side. We need to input the magnitude of the force, two, four, five, zero, zero newtons. Note that we're working in newtons, not kilonewtons here. And when we see the position of that force at the moment, its position in the x direction and its position in the z direction are where we want those forces to be. We want it to be on the top face, giving us our z position of 353.4. And we want it to be at the center of the face in the x direction, giving us 63 millimeters. But rather than being positioned at a y coordinate of 6,000 or 6 meters, we want it positioned at 4,000 millimeters or 4 meters. And we see that our model has been updated accordingly. Let's hit OK. Now, don't worry too much about what's happening on the top of the beam for the time being. It's sufficient at this stage to know that you've applied the correct load to the correct face. Now, there's a couple more things we need to do before we can run this simulation and determine our maximum stresses. Over here on the left hand menu, we have a category for our mesh. Now, when we mesh an object, we apply lots of points throughout the model. And what the FEA software is going to do is it's going to calculate the stress at each of those points. And then what it's going to do is it's going to give us a stress distribution throughout that model. Now, I'm going to keep this as simple as possible, as I mentioned. So if you right click on mesh and then select generate mesh, then Fusion is going to apply the default mesh. We need to make sure we apply a mesh, otherwise Fusion isn't going to know where we want to calculate the stress values. We could define our mesh if we wished. We could make that mesh more refined, creating more calculation points, or less refined, creating less calculation points. But in this particular example, we're keeping things simple and we're using the default mesh. Now I'm just going to pan in on this so you could see what's happened. Now you'll notice here that Fusion has created this mesh and we have all of these points called nodes and the software is going to calculate stresses at each of these nodes based on the applied force that we've defined and the constraints that we've applied to the end of the beam. Now, as mentioned, we could further define that mesh, but we're going to keep this simple for the purpose of this tutorial. Let's go back to the full view of our beam using the home icon in the top right hand corner. On this solve menu here, we have the option to pre-check to make sure Fusion has all the information it needs to resolve our model. And it says the study setup has all of the information required, which is good news. And then the next step then is to solve our simulation. So let's click solve. And here we have solve one study. So the static stress simulation that we've just set up is going to be solved for each of those nodal points. Okay, so once the model has finished running, we can close the job status window. We can also close the results details window for the time being. And we want to see what results we've got for our maximum bending stress and our support reaction acting on this beam. Now, just to make this easier to visualize, we can actually hide our load case, which is preventing us from seeing the beam clearly. And we do that in the left-hand side by clicking on the eye icon 
and you'll notice that the load case disappears. Now at the moment we're displaying safety factors and we can see that the minimum safety factor for our model is 1.09 which means the maximum stress is essentially very close to our failure stress. But for the purpose of this video we're interested in the stress. So in the drop down for safety factor, let's change that to stress. And we're looking specifically for the maximum stress. Now we can see from the graphic in the bottom right hand corner that the maximum stress is 189.825 megapascals. And we also see that that's indicated as being where we applied our support. We can zoom in to take a closer look. And we can see exactly where our maximum stress is taking place. I'm going to make a note of that value, 189.825 megapascals. Now, the other thing that we're interested in is the reaction force at that support. So if we switch from stress to reaction force, now this time we see that our reaction force is 19,457 newtons. And once again, we see that that force is occurring at our support, which is as we would expect. So once again, I'm going to make a note of that value. And then we're going to compare our simulation results to our earlier hand calculations. Now, just as a separate note, I recommend you save your model file here because we're going to be using the same beam for our subsequent simulations for the Encastre beam configuration. So you can finish reviewing the results and hit save and you'll be prompted to save your model. Okay, so we've transferred our simulation results. We had a reaction force of 19,457 newtons, and we had a maximum stress of 189.825. You'll notice that we have one piece of information missing, and this is for maximum bending moment. So when we did our hand calculations, we determined our maximum bending moment, and we used that information to find our stress. But this time we have our stress, and we need to determine our bending moment. Now we know from earlier that we have the equation Z equals M over sigma. Therefore M equals Z times sigma. We have our value of Z from earlier, 0 0.000576. And we now have our simulated value for the stress of 189.825. Now note that this is megapascals, so times 10 to the 6. And that gives us a maximum bending moment value equal to 109339. 109339 Newton meters. Okay, so what do we notice here then? First of all, we notice that the stress obtained through simulations is higher than our stress obtained using hand calculations. But the reassuring thing there is that they're in the same order of magnitude. They're relatively close. If we wanted to err on the side of caution, we could use the stress value determined from our simulations and ensure that any beam that we engineered was capable of supporting that load. Now, because our stress values are relatively close, so are our maximum bending moment values. Again, we see that the maximum bending moment using the simulations is somewhat higher than the maximum bending moment using the hand calculations, but they're in the same order of magnitude. Now, when we come to looking at the reaction forces, we notice that the simulation reaction force is somewhat lower than the hand calculations. But once again, these are all in the same order of magnitude, which gives us additional confidence in both our hand calculations and the values obtained through simulation. Now, just briefly, what might be some of the reasons for these discrepancies? I've already mentioned that we made some small simplifications to the cross section of our I section beam by removing our radiuses here or our flange radiuses. So that may impact on the results. I also mentioned that the density 
or how refined the model mesh is can impact on the accuracy of the calculations. As a general rule, the finer the mesh or the more nodes you have, the more accurate the results that are generated. However, that comes at a cost because the more refined the mesh is, the more calculations the software needs to do in order to resolve the simulation study, and therefore that has an impact on computation time. So for the purposes of this video, there are some discrepancies, but our results are of the right order of magnitude using the two methods, and potential sources of errors might be simplifications we made to the model, or discrepancies may have arised because we used the standard default mesh in Fusion 360. We'll talk more about errors and discrepancies in the next video, but I hope this video has been a useful introduction into the use of Fusion 360 in order to carry out finite element analysis simulations.